I'll skip that. <clears throat> so in thinking about kicking off the discussion, I, I thought about obstacles and opportunities. I mean, this isn't the first time the scientific community has thought about large-scale sequencing in cohorts, and so it has a history. So I thought we could think about what are the obstacles and, and, and how can we overcome them, just as a way of kicking this off. You know, I think Rick had a real nice slide toward the end that, you know, sequencing costs are high, but they are coming down. And, um, you know, it's, I don't think it's a good idea that we make an argument that we should wait. I always hearken back to the old PC days, is when should you buy a PC, is, you know, going through the, you know, the XT, the AT, the this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, it's going to constantly evolve, and, and we're going to use the best technology for the question at the right time. Peter talked a little bit about this, and I'm going to say more um, throughout this discussion about the IT infrastructure. You know, one of the things that concerns me is the current biomedical, at least, biomedical IT infrastructure really isn't up to the task. And I'm extremely excited about this project actually enabling and being the catalyst that enables improvement in the IT infrastructure in the biomedical community. Um, I think one of the things that concerns me is if we create, and I'm going to use the word scientific commons here in a couple slides, if we create this large space where we have large scale phenotype, electronic medical record, and genomic and other omic information that's, that's linked in a way that it can be adequately queried to answer questions, <clears throat> that there's only a few places in the country and the world that can actually handle that. And I'd hate to see um, genomics and biomedical research go the way of physics, that there's only two or three places that have the collider <clears throat> appropriate for the experiment. So I'm wondering if during the, the next, uh, whatever it is, 16 hours, <clears throat> we can think about the use of the cloud as an example. I'm not pushing the cloud, but use of, of, of creative IT infrastructure. So we, we not only are making these data available, we're making the data available so it can be used to answer questions. I think, you know, and it's not just a server that's serving out data to other people. It's actually a place where people can query the data for, to answer questions. Another um, comment I hear a lot about is the perfect study sample is not available. Um, you know, and I, I don't think there is going to be any one perfect study sample that's ever going to be available, frankly. And, uh, but, but I think we need to think about way that we, ways that we can bring together collections of existing and emerging samples that will achieve the goals that we come up with over the next few hours um, and, not, and stop thinking about the, the, the perfect study that, that we're all looking for as we can bring together. I think we come very close by bringing together existing and as I, I'm emphasizing there in emerging studies. Another is that, you know, this is, shouldn't be seen as a U.S. effort, both this meeting and I actually, I think another exciting opportunity is to rekindle the international uh, spirit that the, the Genome Project had and we can, re this study should reach around the globe. I know there are initiatives being launched, I don't think just at NHGRI, but across the NIH in Africa, for example. Um, obviously, there's a lot happening in Asia, so I think this, this, um, large-scale cohort studies, you know, sequencing in large cohort studies should be seen really as an international effort. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, I guess sitting in Washington, we have to address that this really isn't the right time. You know, people talk about, is this the right time to, to launch such a study because of the economic uncertainty in the country? Um, my prediction is, first, that this kind of study will be done. And, and if we launch it in, in an efficient and organized way and we're result-oriented, at the end of the day, we're going to save money by, having, by giving it uh, the structure of people around this table and, and again, being, being very driven and being very efficient and not just piecing it together over time, which I think in the end would cost a lot more. So by creating this um, resource is the word I use for the scientific community in this, in this commons, I think we'll re at the end of the day we'll, we'll not only save money, we'll, we'll promote uh, better uh, science and, and better health care. The other thing is that institutional and disciplinary silos are going to undermine this effort. And, and I talked about it at the other meeting. I think we really need to work hard to, to remove those silos um, and, and make sure that, that 
across the scientific community and the epidemiologic community, the genomics community, healthcare, the basic sciences. Um, the leadership works hard to bring all those people on board, that we do a lot of community engagement, in this case not the community of the participants but the scientific community, and, um, and, and make sure they're fully engaged and see the benefits of, a, of, of such an expenditure and, and, and try to think of ways and, and with, from them and, and within that these data can be used across the scientific community. Whoops, I <laughs> Freudian slip. And I, I mentioned the scientific commons, and you know, I just threw some large, large studies out there that just as examples. I think we need to think of ways where multiple of these studies, large studies, and I put you know, charge as a lot of NHLBI cohort studies coming together, UK Biobank is represented here, a, lar a large initiative, the National Children's Study, I think contribute, we should not think of this only as a study of the elderly, um, but across the, the lifespan, and there are many large cohorts that can come together, and we should, we should talk over the next day of what this scientific commons looks like of bringing these data together, as Peter said, that has both genomic information, phenotypic information, and it's growing and, and increasing in value over time because of um, the accumulation of phenotypic information and our ability to recontact and remeasure people have specific mutations that we've identified. And then I've already touched on two different analysis models. I, I think the, the typical dbGaP kind of models this is this commons is really a, a data server and it's pushing data out for other people to analyze. And, we can argue about how well that works, and, and it has been argued how well that works. Um, but really, I, I think you know that's one model. I, what concerns me is this data is going to be so large and complicated that that's quickly going to outstrip the vast majority of investigators. And I think we need to come up with more creative ways of which people on the outside are, are, are reaching into the scientific commons and actually analyzing it centrally. And whether it's in the cloud or not, I'm not an expert to, to argue. But I think we need to find ways of which investigators across the spectrum of science can, can analyze these data when we create it. It will be an outstanding resource, but if it's sitting somewhere and they can't download it and they can't work with it in their home structure, <clears throat> it's actually, even though we can tout that it's publicly available, it's useless because it's, it's, it would overwhelm them. So we need to create opportunities so they can ping the data from outside. And then, you know, I also think there's ways of organizing this, you know, I've got several ideas. One is, you know, think about this as across the lifespan. I think one of the things we tend to think when we talk about sequencing in large cohorts um, and in, <clears throat> well represented around this table, we're typically thinking of the of elderly people with complex diseases of later life, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and the like. But I think it's really wise for us in terms of engagement of the community. Is there a complex diseases throughout life? There's autism has been mentioned several times. Um, there are numerous complex birth defects. And I really think when we, when we think about bringing together and, and the, the um, criteria for cohorts to join us, I think it would be a mistake to think about just um, the later life. You'll also notice, by the way, that there tends to be a dearth of samples in the, in the middle years. Um, that could be because there's a dearth of disease in those middle years, but we, we really should, as we br bring this together, think about whether that needs to be filled in. And I, I'm repeating myself now, we have to make sure that it's um, representative across ethnic and socioeconomic um, strata. I won't say more about data sharing, that's already been hit. I, I think the other issue is we need to do better of recognizing it, uh, our successes. Uh, you know, we. Um, we're trained to be critical, and, and many of us are well trained to be critical. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we, we have in this community a large number of successes, and we need to get them out to the community and make sure we, we tout the successes of genomic research and population-based research. Um, it, has, it has offered medical care a lot, and uh, so I think we need to, as we build this, it's not going to be built overnight, but as we built it, we need to think about the successes and get it out there. Then finally, you know, what we've come together is, is really, uh, you know, it's, a, it's quite a large ideal that we're trying to reach. So I would encourage us um, to set big goals. Um, I'm an optimist, 
and I like big goals, but, but at the end of the day, we have to break those big goals into a series of defined steps and timelines and deliverables. And uh, the, the slide on the left is, uh, I think, you know, we've met the enemy and they're us, and it, you know, it's up to us really to well, well articulate those goals, bring the community along and define um, what are the steps to reach those goals. So that, that is my um, two cents to kick this off, and the floor is open, and I encourage others to, to contribute. So on, on this issue of the adequacy of some uh, aggregation of current uh, patient resources, yeah. uh, it, uh, it gets back to the question that, that we discussed a little bit the first round about the nature of the phenotypic data that you want. And that's where I, I, I actually favor this rather first pass of broad phenotyping uh, for some of the reasons that Francis articulated. Uh, that's where I see some weakness in the currently available resources. I don't know so much about some of the, the non-US ones, but here, the, the, uh, just the strong incentives operating primarily uh, in the biomedical research community you know, are to, to get a collection of patients that were chosen on rather narrow phenotypic grounds and to, to study the relevant aspects of that phenotype in great depth. And I'm just not so sure that if we put lots of those things together, we're going to get what we need. I would agree with you, but also <clears throat> there are sample collections <clears throat> of very deeply phenotyped individuals that are, have literally thousands of things measured on them across disease entities. It is true they tend to have a disease focus, but they're not simply cases that were sampled from a clinical setting, for example. They're very deeply phenotyped, and they have been very deeply phenotyped over time. And I think many of those would at least partially meet your criteria. And then going back to the previous discussion, I'm a big fan of once we then invest in the sequencing and we identify homozygotes, for example, with PCSK9 deficiency, then you can bring those people back in into the C, what we used to call CRCs, the CTSA setting, and deep, you know, even more deeply phenotype them in a, in a, in a clinical care setting. So, so going that route, we'd, we'd presumably have to prepare for a lot of reconsenting and so forth. I, I, I just don't think that there are very many uh, groups out there that are consented in a way that will fuel your scientific commons and so I would forth. guess there's probably 60 to 100,000 people that are well phenotyped that are consented for recontact. Wow, uh, yeah. That's, that's a ballpark. I'd like to hear more about them. I might, might just comment on a, a workshop think tank that we had held a couple of years ago asking the same idea, new sort of new models for prospective studies and recognizing that many of the diseases, the incentives are, or, or the cohorts, there's a, there is an incentive to, to focus on a specific disease. But wouldn't it be cool if, if in each of those cohorts we could collect some core of information that is, is common or is, maybe not common, but is critical to all of the NIH institutes, you know, so so that in in the cardiovascular cohorts you do collect cancer and and mental health and that, not a lot of it, but but at least enough so that you can do some basic phenotyping and some basic um, um, you know evaluation of those cohorts, pick out some interesting cases, and so so that was a, a model that was proposed. It, uh, I don't know that it's gained a, a great deal of traction, but it, it may be something that we'd want to consider over the course of, of tomorrow. To say this. Can I bring up a point on that topic? I hate to say this with the gentleman to my right. Is that I think one of the issues we have is we tend we have these institutes under the NIH, and they they have disease, with the exception of a few. They tend to have a disease focus, and the money goes through those, and so we tend to have diabetes cohorts, heart disease cohorts, cancer cohorts, etc. And and that's one of the silos I think we need to not to bring down, but to restructure so we can phenotype across the NIH in a constructive way. And I think that's happening in the presence in the room of representatives from many of those ICs is just, uh, I think, a very concrete uh, representation of that recognition that the more we are doing things in a trans-NIH way, uh, the better we all are 
uh, downstream. Um, I think it's unlikely we're going to change the structure of the 27 institutes and centers given how much pain and suffering it was to change just one of them over the course <laughs> of the last two years. <laughs> so what you see is what you get, but we can clearly uh, work along the lines that you're talking about, and I think there's a lot of motivation to do that. There was a question. So to follow up on your comment, uh, I think we all agree on the importance of longitudinal follow-up of folks. I mean, we're, how do you actually see that happening? Is it going to be through the research unit, through the healthcare provider, uh, through patient-based, or all of the above? I mean, practically speaking, how, how do you, can you describe models where that's worked? You know the kind of cohort prospective cohort model is 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 one that that's well in in place um, within the NHLBI. There are a number of cohorts. Framingham's one I'm familiar with, but but um, you know where where it's it's set up and and you establish biobanks and um, you know have 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 a lot of things in place to to be able to go back to either samples or or the participants and have consent in place. So that's a, that's but those are that's sort of the, what you might call the prospective cohort model, and maybe Rory can comment on on the kind of UK biobank kind of model. Can, can I say that essentially the same thing is we'll talk a bit more about it tomorrow. But what we're calling cancer cohorts, you understand, don't start with people with cancer. They just start with people, two million of them enrolled in forty-seven cohorts and. Last year, we polled, and a third of the cohorts in the club pretty extensively go after a couple of other endpoints, too. Not everybody does everything, but what Dr. Collins was describing is, I think, what everybody who's got a cohort is trying to do. That's one. And then I would say, and these are older cohorts. It's a mix of young and old. But I'd say maybe a sixth of them also do have routine sequential recontact. Some of the contact is as far away as 10 years, but for a, the, the cohorts that can afford it, then they go back much more frequently. So these, these things are pretty much what cohorts like to do, want to do, money permitting. I, I think it's done more uniformly in the biobank, and you might want to talk about that. I mean, I think in, in general, one wants to embed these cohorts ideally in a setting where you can get follow-up of the widest possible range of health outcomes easily. You want to do it on a large scale. And I mean, that was the, the basis for UK Biobank. So we can link electronically to death, cancer, all hospitalizations, and um, from the end of this year, all primary care. Um, so all of those data are coming in and being linked into the database. Um, and we have consent to then go back to participants to get information, uh, as well as to get more information about the health records. But I, I think it, the general approach would be to embed the studies in situations where you can do that readily if you want to do it on a really large scale. Uh, I'll just echo what Rory just said. I, I think that to do this right, uh, it, it makes sense to link to healthcare outcomes. And, and so my task tomorrow will be to talk about the electronic record and, and, and those sorts of issues. But I, that the electronic record is, is totally agnostic with respect to diagnosis. And, uh, and interesting things happen when you start to excavate in that, in that set. And it turns out that it's not really simple to excavate in that set. But, um, but I think that that's another, another really, really promising approach. And I... And I Eric, I think you ought to add electronic record cohorts up there. I, I'm looking at my numbers, and Emerge 2 has 313,000 samples, or 313,000 participants, yeah, samples. Comments? So we have had, I, people will help me if I miss someone, two um, individuals have come in during the, during the discussion, Nancy Cox and also Gail Jarvik, so welcome. Did I miss anybody? Snuck in? Probably saw people sneak out. 